talk about the Dirty Hand of Chevron campaign, and it's also from the Embassy of Ecuador. Doug Speck, who's a writer and academic at the University of Westminster, is going to look at how El Salvador and communities are battling with multinationals, amongst other issues. And John Hillary from War on Want, who's been um, speaking a lot lately about the effects of TTIP and what we can do about that. So our first speaker is going to be Daniel um, from the GB Debt campaign. So welcome. So the Financial Times have labelled it the sovereign debt trial of the century. A handful of wealthy billionaire speculators who own a few US hedge funds have been holding Argentina's entire economy to ransom in a recent case that is going to have enormous ramifications not just for Argentina and Latin America, but the entire international debt system. I'm going to explain how one of the most grotesque facets of international finance capitalism, that of speculation on uh, national debt, has and will continue to generate social catastrophes if left unregulated. But I also come with a message of hope, because the international solidarity with Argentina that the case has generated has led to the emergence of a new global consensus around the need to rewrite the sovereign debt restructuring process and outlaw these absurd speculative practices. Finally, I'm going to argue that the legitimacy of Argentina's debt and that of other Latin American countries needs to be challenged in order to help their peoples escape from the long-term problem of debt dependence. So first of all, what are vulture funds? Well, they refer to hedge funds that hoover up bonds on the secondary market of developing countries that are facing debt defaults, usually for a matter of cents on the dollar of their nominal value. These funds then wait until the debt restructuring process negotiations take place and then sue the country for tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars in profit, demanding that the country makes full repayment on the original loan or bond value plus interest plus penalty fees. Peru, Liberia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Zambia are amongst the other countries that have all suffered similar fates in recent years. But incredibly, despite the fact that although their actions that the vultures um, are effectively causing hun uh, involve hundreds of thousands of deaths in the poorest countries by denying their governments of millions of dollars that could be spent fighting disease and fighting poverty, these practices are completely legal and almost entirely unregulated. I should also say that vulture funds have become very active in Europe since the 2008 crisis. So for example, Dart Management has made a 250 million euro profit on Greek debt, and those of you that are co-op account holders might know that Aurelius Capital, one of the same funds extorting Argentina, um, invested in the co-op bank and forced it to demutualise in 2011. So what exactly happened in Argentina? Well, after President Carlos Menem's neoliberal reforms in the 1990s, its government was forced to commit the largest ever sovereign debt default in history to the tune of approximately $81 billion. Its economy crashed through the floor, unemployment rose to 25%, over half the Argentinian population fell into poverty. In the years that followed, after tough negotiations by the new government of President Nestor Kirchner and then that of his wife, Cristina, 93% of the country's creditors agreed to write off two-thirds of the value of the bonds. Uh, the debts that they were owed. Partly thanks to this, Argentina's economy subsequently became the fastest growing economy in the Western Hemisphere and 11 million people were lifted out of poverty. So debt default proved to be the right thing to do in Argentina despite the initial pain. The problem was that a small number of Argentina's creditors, vulture funds like NML and Aurelius, refused to agree to debt write-downs even though they still would have gained hundreds of millions of dollars, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in profits by doing so. Instead, they're suing Argentina for the full amount of what their original bonds are worth, that's to say a profit of 1,400%. Now in August 2013, a judge in a court in New York where the bonds were originally issued ruled that Argentina must pay $1.3 billion to Aurelius and NML. That's the current debt uh, bond value plus interest. Now you might ask, why did Argentina not simply pay them? You know, $1.3 billion is a lot of money, but when you're a G20 country with reserves of $30 billion, it's not impossible. Well first, President Cristina Kirchner has taken a hard line against the vulture fund. 
And in contrast to the neoliberal policy recipe, has part renationalised key sectors of the economy, such as aviation and oil, and has spent large sums on social programmes and poverty alleviation um, programmes that are targeted the poorest in society. But secondly, and more importantly, paying the vultures would have a a activated the pari passu clause. This means that all creditors have to be treated equally, on equal terms, in terms of their repayment terms. But which, according to the judge's interpretation, if Argentina made more debt payments to the debt swap participants, those that had renegotiated their bond payments, um, it would have, they, Argentina would then also have to pay the vulture funds in full. However, because of another clause, it's called the RUFO clause, the rights upon future offers, if NML and Aurelius had subsequently been paid in full, according to the judge's uh, ver um, ruling, 93% of the country's bondholders that had previously agreed to write-downs would then be entitled to sue Argentina for the full amount of the original debt value. In other words, it would have left the Argentinian government with a bill of perhaps $100 billion, which would have not only forced it into debt default, but of course the crisis probably even worse than that of 2001. Now the judicial proceedings themselves were full, fraught with allegations of nepotism, um, abuse of authority and a lack of judicial independence. So for example, the judge, Thomas Grisser, was a lifelong Republican, but was presiding over a case um, that was brought by uh, Paul Singer, the billionaire CEO of NML, who also happened to be one of the Republican Party's largest donors. Many also claim that Grisser acted illegally by seeking to nullify the 2000 and 2000 2005-2010 bond restructuring agreement that contractually agreed between Argentina and its creditors. In June 2014, Griesa embargoed a half a billion dollar interest payment that Argentina had made to its restructured bondholders until the vultures were also paid. This triggered a Kafkaesque kind of situation under which um, the credit agencies dubiously declared Argentina to be in debt default, even though it both had the financial ability to pay and the will to pay almost all of its creditors. So what are the consequences of this ruling, and why are they so important for the international community? Well, first of all, it set a legal precedent under which the rights of a handful of billionaire speculators uh, to make enormous profits on their investments supersede those of a right of a sovereign nation to defend its people under international law. Secondly, because the ruling is likely to have far-reaching consequences and cause far-reaching instability in the global financial system. Indeed, future debt restructurings by crisis-ridden countries may become impossible because the hedge funds will no longer have any incentives to write off all the debts, knowing that they can simply go to a court, cite the Argentina case, and be granted right to the full amount of the, the debts they were previously owed. Um, countries in the global south could therefore be condemned to generations of austerity and structural adjustment as the only way of meeting repayment in the absence of the possibility of debt restructuring or sourcing new loans. Thirdly, as a direct result of this ludicrous situation, and here's some positive news, there is an emerging consensus on the need to regulate the speculative financial practices and vulture fund activity. Argentina gained global sympathy, especially in the South, where national governments started to realise that their citizens too could become the victims of an unregulated global debt system. Um, in, 2000, in September 2014, 133 nations in the G77 um, plus China, the BRICS, UNISOR and other organisations got together to overwhelmingly force through a resolution at the UN General Assembly um, that would create a multilateral legal framework for the sovereign debt restructuring process for the first time. This could prevent vulture funds from blocking um, debt restructuring in the future. Meanwhile, a tremendous degree of solidarity has also been shown in the North. For example, here in the UK, Jubilee Debt Campaign has gathered the support of 106 MPs to sign an early day motion. Several thousand British citizens also signed a petition, which I'm going to pass around in a minute, condemning the New York court's verdict, um, supporting Argentina's right not to pay the vulture funds, and requesting that um, Argentina carries out a public debt audit to ascertain the extent of illegitimate debt. A separate statement of solidarity with Argentina was signed by a huge number of British M um, MPs, trade unionists, intellectuals, journalists and economists, 
Um, and the Jubilee Debt Campaign also organised two protests outside the headquarters of NML in London. I just want to end by talking about the legitimacy question. Because despite these positive moves, um, they will not actually resolve the problem of the perpetual cycle of debt crisis that Argentina um, suffers from every decade or so. Whilst the Kitcher governments have quite rightly sought to break free from dependency on Western financial institutions by paying off the IMF, the Paris Club and other international creditors, alternative funding sources offer little hope. Like many Latin American nations, Argentina is developing closer ties with China, but the danger is that its significant loans and investments will simply duplicate patterns of dependency. Meanwhile, although some have pointed to the new BRICS development bank, it appears as if they would leave debt to countries with little room for manoeuvre to escape neoliberalism's financial infrastructure because they require an on-track arrangement with the IMF in order to qualify for financial assistance. Instead, as a mechanism to emancipate its citizens from the burden of debt dependence, and so as to regain national sovereignty, what I and Jubilee Debt are arguing for here is that Argentina conducts a public audit of its debt in order to de determine the amount of debt that can be deemed illegitimate and then refuse to pay that amount. And there's more good news here. Recently, the Argentinian Congress passed a sovereign payments law, part of which establishes such an audit. One must remember that Judge Ballestero ruled in the Olmos Cause in 2000 that a large part of the debt origin, de origins of Argentina's debt date back to the military dictatorship in the 1970s and 80s, when, in violation of the Argentinian constitution, the Junta sought loans from international capital to fund the murder and disappearance of 30,000 Argentinian citizens. Aside from being odious, having been accrued through 477 separate fraudulent and arbitrary acts, brings the debt's very legality into question. Just to finish, in 2008, as many of you may know, Ecuador's President Correa established a commission which found that 70% of the country's debt was illegitimate. Through partial debt default and um, selective buyback, the country's debt burden was slashed by $3 billion. It currently stands as one of the fastest growing economies in the region today. Public debt audits are feasible, and refusing to pay does not mean financial Armageddon. Losses from unilateral debt cancellation would largely be confined to um, a handful of millionaire fund executives, while the benefits of uh, job creation, poverty reduction, and wealth redistribution would be truly unimaginable. Thank you. And I'm going to hand over to our next speaker now, Fidel Navas from the of Ecuador, but also <coughs> speaking about the uh, campaign against um, the dirty hand of Chevron. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, for those who were in the same, uh, in this same room uh, uh, in the workshop before, uh, you heard about the inspirational achievements that Ecuador is setting up right now. Uh, however, now I want to focus in something not very inspirational. I'm having trouble hearing at the back. I don't know if you want to stand. Higher. Or, yeah. Or higher. Higher. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to focus on a real threat. <laughs> In a real threat for uh, Ecuador as a country coming up from one of the most powerful companies in the world, the company Chevron Texaco. Uh, I want to point out that the transnational strategy as, we know, as you know, is based on operational advantages of the multinational companies, principally in developing countries. <coughs> advantages such as the availability of raw materials, low salaries, less labor conflict, weak labor and environmental regulations, and special fiscal treatment. Such, um, these new empires of the 21st century some, I'm referring to the transnationals, some of which have attained positions that previously correspond only to nation, nation states, due to their disproportionate economic and political power, systematically violate the rules of the game and exploit the populations and nature as expendable factors of production in the pursuit of increasing capital without control. 
It's very clear that the legal and institutional and political hole in the contemporary international scene regarding the interactions between multinational companies, states, and civil society. Traditionally, international treaties impose obligations on states, not on companies. International law hardly regulates transnational corporations. And when it does, it generally protects the interest in steps of imposing responsibilities and obligations. An enigmatic case that evidences transnational natural genocide and the indifference toward human rights is the contamination inflicted by Chevron Texaco in the Ecuador Amazon. The transnational Chevron, which absorbed Texaco in 2001, is the second largest oil company in the USA and the seventh largest in the world. Texaco operated in Ecuador from 1964 to 1992. During that period, was respons responsible for spilling no less than 71 million liters of toxic oil waste and 64 million liters of crude oil on more than 2 million hectares of the Ecuador Amazon, which is one of most of one of the most biodiverse, biodiverse regions in the world. Two million hectares is the size of Glasgow, the third largest city in the UK. All this according to a court in Ecuador after 19 years of trial. This environmental disaster called by many as the Amazon Chernobyl is perhaps one of the biggest ever. And I know many of you haven't heard about that because it didn't happen in a, in, in a developed country. It happened in an underdeveloped country. And it happened very far away in the Amazon region. It is more than 80 times bigger than the BP accident in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. 80 times bigger. Chevron Texaco, uh, Texaco disaster, in fact, was not an accident. It was a deliberate and systematic action, long-term action, because the company extracted millions of barrels of petroleum without using the methods agreed upon in the exploitation contract with Ecuadorian state for the preservation of nature, which is the secure re-injection of toxic waste into the ground, even though it used and patented these mechanisms in the United States. The company in the United States used one technology, and they have to use the same technology elsewhere, but they didn't. The irresponsibility and economic uh, power of this transnational reached such a point that Without any difficulty, it broke its contract with the Ecuadorian state, international law, and human rights, and its only method of environmental remediation was covering up waste from the extraction process of petroleum with superficial layer of earth and organic material in low-tech process, like one bearing a criminal act. Well, facing this excessive natural disaster, the affected communities denounced the transnational before the courts in New York in 1993. The communities affected put a lawsuit against the company in 1993 in New York. A process that Texaco rejected by arguing that the competence of the case lay in Ecuadorian courts. Chevron didn't want to be sued in the United States. They wanted to be sued in Ecuador because they thought that they, they will easily buy the justice in Ecuador. In 2002, the US courts ended up approving the transfer of Chevron Texaco, and Chevron Texaco agreed to respect the decisions of the courts in Ecuador. Thus, the case was resolved in Ecuador in 2009 and 2011, and a court sentenced Chevron to pay 9.6 <coughs> billion dollars and issue a public apology. 
despite economic and political pressure, lobbying, buying the conscience of judicial officials, and even Chevron declaring its acceptance of the Ecuador court, the transnational refused and continues to refuse to this day to comply with the final sanction. On the contrary, Chevron initiated a multi-million dollar international campaign to delegitimize and discredit the Ecuador state so that the state will assume the economic sanction of the criminal acts carried out against the environment and human rights. At least eight lobbying firms have exerted political pressure for several years on members of the Congress and the US Department of Commerce to discredit Ecuador and affect its commercial interests in the United States. Every day, websites and social media provide biased information to undermine the judicial process that took place in Ecuador. We can trace much of Chevron's aggressive, well-planned public relations strategy back to a 2008 document by San Francisco's Master of Crisis Communications, Mr. Sam Singer. I heard that same surname by the Republican in your uh, exposition, who recommended Chevron going to the offensive. The company should portray Ecuador's court system as corrupt with collusion between judges and the plaintiffs in the lawsuit. This was written two years before the ruling of the courts came into place in 2011. Just to give you an idea, because this is a document that the plaintiffs got access through the courts. Mr. Singh is recommending to attack Ecuador as a place where freedom of speech is threatened in Ecuador by government taking over TV stations, press censorship. Is Ecuador the next major threat to America? <laughs> Alliances by the Ecuadorian government with China for arms and military issues, Iran for energy, and possibly alliances with Russia leads one to wonder if Ecuador is the next Cuban missile crisis in the making. <laughs> and so on and so forth. And the offensive, offensive goes all, in all fronts, of course. Chevron is suing the Ecuadorian government before the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague. This court has accepted the litigation based on a bilateral investment treaty between Ecuador and the United States, a treaty which took effect in 1997. That is five years after Texaco investment in the country ended. Despite the treaty is not retroactive, the court deemed competent and ordered the government of Ecuador to suspend the enforcement of the judgment. The lawyers who sued Chevron in Ecuador have come, on, have come under non-stop attack from the transnational. Chevron has hauled them into court in New York, accusing them of fraud and extortion. And this year, that US court has ruled that Ecuadorian court's judgment could not be enforced in the United States. While complex litigation continues with multiple cases in, the multiple, in, in multiple international arenas, it is clear that Chevron, aside from the undeniable environmental damage and human rights violations of the affected communities, threatens Ecuadorian democracy by intervening in the legal system with chicanery and economic power. Chevron intends to bring down the economic and financial stability of the country by claiming that the state is responsible for the environmental reparations. The answer to the problem of abs absence of national and international control and regulation of transnational corporations can only be achieved through political will of states and the awakening of global civil society. I invite all of you to sign to the campaign we have an information table uh, in the main hall, and we have an exhibition with uh, pictures of the damage caused by children. <laughs>
can only be achieved through political will of states and the awakening of global civil society to configure a binding legal and institutional framework with the power to control multinational companies in order to prioritize human life and healthy environment over capital. Thank you. Can I just underline those points about supporting the campaign and getting involved and, and, and visiting the stall? You know, I think it's really important that that we get the, that information out widely and support the campaign. So our next speaker then is, is Doug Speck from okay. the University of Westminster. Uh, so I arrived this morning with a 15-minute presentation and slides. I'm now going to do 10 minutes without slides, so we'll see how that goes. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, El Salvador uh, and the, the, the case with Pacific Rim, uh, who have been suing El Salvador. I'm going to take you through a potted history of what's been happening there, and then we're going to, to look at some of the, the modes and tools of resistance uh, that I've been working with uh, through my research uh, at Westminster. Um, so some of you might, might already be familiar with the, with the case. Uh, we're talking about the Cabanas region in northern uh, El Salvador here. Uh, in 2002, the Canadian uh, mining company, Pacific Rim Mining Corp, uh, they merged with uh, another uh, mining company, Dayton Mining, uh, and re uh, in that process they acquired the El Dorado uh, prospect in Cabanas. Uh, they started uh, prospecting very quickly um, and over the next four years they estimated that they uh, put 80 million dollars into prospecting in the area that's their their estimates uh, they carried out their first environmental uh, impact assessment two years after they started this uh, which they submitted to the Salvadoran Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources uh, and of course uh, found that there would be no environmental issues at all uh, this didn't really sit very well with environmentalists uh, in, the, in the area. Uh, in 2005, a hydrologist, uh, Robert Moran, conducted his own assessment um, and he looked at the, the, the Pacific Rim one and, and pointed to their complete lack of baseline water qualities, uh, the lack of transparency with the public, which uh, is required under Salvadoran law, um, and the failure to look at the impact of what they termed free water use. Uh, i.e. they would just use the water because it's free uh, and if you have any idea about uh, mining you'll know that it requires absolutely vast quantities of water to extract gold. Uh, after this uh, impact assessment was done by Robert, the uh, opposition to the mine started to grow and the, the, the National Roundtable Against Metallic Mining was established in, in 2006. Uh, Pacific Rim continued their explorations, uh, not just in El Salvador, all around the world. And they actually uh, they acquired a US uh, company, uh, Pac Rim Cayman, uh, in 2007, uh, which actually would become quite significant later on. Uh, in 2008, ranchers in the Cabanas region, they, they started to notice that the springs and wells were starting to already go dry. Uh, the mine hasn't been started yet, we're just in the exploration phase and we're already drying up our wells. And this again, in, this increased again the, uh, the opposition to the mining. And eventually, in March 2009, uh, the FMLN uh, won the elections, uh, and one of the things that they had actually said they were going to stand for uh, was the ban of metallic mining in El Salvador, um, amongst many other things. And, and they were true to their word, and they did ban metallic mining, uh, which a short-lived victory. One month later, uh, Pacific Rim carried out its threat to sue El Salvador for $100 million uh, through the uh, Central America United States Free Trade Agreement uh, in the International Center for Settlement and Investment Disputes. Uh, now, they shouldn't have been able to do this because this is a uh, trade agreement between the United States. Uh, however, because they had acquired this subsidy, uh, the United States company, uh, they were allowed to begin that process of suing the Salvadoran government. Uh, now, at this point, the, the uh, campaign against the mine started to take a, a rather darker turn. Uh, later that year, four anti-mining activists were murdered, uh, and the journalists from uh, Radio Victoria who reported on, on that murder were thems uh, themselves started to receive death threats, and a local priest who had denounced the murders were, was kidnapped, uh, although he was later released. Uh, inside the courts, uh, El Salvador filed back against uh, Pacific Rim in January 2010, um, and the first hearings were held in May and June uh, of that year, which upheld Pacific Rim's right to sue El Salvador for loss of profits and investment. Uh, 
Outside of the courts, uh, blood continued to be shed on the streets of Cabanas. In December 2010, uh, one of those convicted of those 2009 uh, murders, uh, was at, uh, who was actually released because he was a minor, uh, he himself was actually murdered. Uh, and this was followed in January 2011 uh, by further murder uh, of someone who had testified in that court case and further death threats to Radio Victoria, now specifically targeting uh, what they called their three loudest mouths. Um, the, yes, and members of the round table uh, of, for metallic mining, they also continued to receive death threats both to themselves and their family. And in June of 2011, another anti-mining activist was murdered. Uh, the tensions continued to grow, both inside and outside of the court. Uh, eventually, in 2012, it was ruled that Pacific Rim could not sue under CAFTA uh, because they didn't have enough uh, ownership of the United States company. Uh, again, uh, another short-lived victory. Uh, it's an emotional roller coaster, really, uh, because it was decided they could continue to pursue uh, El Salvador under El Salvador's own 1999 investment law, which prohibits expiration, uh, expropriation without compensation. Then in 2013, Pacific Rim decided that actually 100 million uh, was not enough, uh, and they, they upped their claim to just over 300 million dollars, uh, basing that on the fact that gold has skyrocketed in price by this time. Uh, however, the court case was costing them a, a, a lot of money, and eventually uh, they, they sold out uh, and sold the whole company off to Oceana Gold, who are a mysterious company, technically Australian, floated on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Uh, this is a very common tactic of mining companies involved in large uh, lawsuits, change the name, sell off parts of the company to other uh, people, really break down the, um, the fight against them by confusing who you're targeting in court. Um, earlier this year, uh, processes began to hold Pacific Rim to account over its human rights uh, record in El Salvador. And that case is continuing. And actually, the, uh, the round table for, against metallic mining uh, are in Switzerland, in Geneva, next week at a, uh, a uh, part of that trial. Uh, the lawsuit against El Salvador is still underway under the name of Oceana Gold now. Uh, we are kind of expecting results at any moment. Uh, so what does this all mean for our, our modes of resistance? What does this mean in the context of TTIP? Uh, well, I, for starters, it's, it's alarming that they were able to, to undertake this lawsuit under the CAFTA agreement. And when we're thinking about TTIP and these kind of agreements, uh, perhaps that's something that we need to be very concerned about. Uh, as it was stated by the Association for Local Economic Development in El Salvador, uh, this lawsuit was really like the perpetrator suing the victim. Uh, so where does that leave us? Uh, probably a bit lost, I would say. I mean, these are, these are huge uh, motions that we have very little power over, perhaps. Uh, how do we begin to fight against these, these huge juggernauts, these behemoths? Uh, Pacific Rim, they had the power to deny any involvement in any of the murders. Uh, nothing's been proven, no one's ever investigated them. Uh, they actually blame the local NGOs for the events that have happened. Uh, again, a tactic that we see time and time again around the globe, blaming uh, local movements for creating social unrest, for orchestrating the murders and death threats. They do this to, to undermine local knowledge structures to, uh, and break down the ability for the resistance to operate. Uh, so how do, we, how do we fight back? How do we create a more level playing field? Uh, or um, How do we produce more evidence that enables us to actually stand up and fight against these kinds of things? Uh, now, my, my research at the moment, I'm looking at locally produced, open access, geospatial information, which is a very long, uh, kind of uh, wordy, academic-y kind of thing. But stay with me, I'm going to try and uh, make that into a, a real thing for you. So, what I'm looking at is, is how we can use digital technologies in these struggles. And we have been working with uh, communities in El Salvador uh, recently, but we've also been working uh, a lot in Colombia uh, and, and various places around the world. And I want to take you through uh, why I think this works uh, uh, and uh, how we can better use digital technologies in uh, what we're doing. I'm being told I need to go faster. I'm going to skip out that little example. Um, <laughs> Sorry. It was a terrible example anyway. Uh, it was actually a very good example. Come and talk to me about it later. Uh, so we're looking at geospatial information. One of the reasons we want to, to do that is uh, 
and I'm going uh, to quickly do that example, from Syria. In Syria, it is estimated there are half a million videos of human rights abuses. Many of these videos are very similar to things that I get sent quite regularly from Central America, from South America, from all around the world in the work that I do. These videos are rarely permissible in court. They can rarely be used uh, as evidence of human rights abuses. One video from 2011 became permissible when a young brave man decided to go back to where he was beaten and show using his smartphone, he geolocated where that video was, he could prove where it happened, he could prove who had been involved in the human rights abuses. So we're now looking at how we can use this kind of geospatial information. We've developed uh, a tool that we are giving away free to grassroots movements in but all around the world, we're working particularly with uh, El Salvador in recent weeks, where they can geolocate these abuses, these murders, these things that are happening, uh, in order to be able to uh, make their, their claims more permissible. And we think this is much more useful than social media, which unfortunately rather silos information into specific Facebook pages or following Twitter accounts. Instead, uh, we're advocating that because the global corporations don't operate within national boundaries, we need to better work uh, cross boundaries, cross collaboratively, sharing local knowledge better with geospatial information built in so it can be permissible. And instead of starting from zero every time, sharing the information, uh, pooling our collective knowledge much better. And then with one, nose, with one voice, we can actually say no to the oppressive, exploitive free trade agreements. Apologies to the speakers for cutting them off, but it's just so that we have at least a little bit of time for discussion at the end, because I know the time's a bit against us. And so moving on that issue of how do we fight and the issues, uh, John Hillary. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I'll try and sort of bring all this together perhaps in, in a short um, presentation about what we can do next, because I think it's no coincidence that we're seeing this, this battle royal between capital and the forces of society, labour, communities in the context of Latin America. We've heard these three, three examples from Latin America. But actually, Latin America has provided a beacon of hope for the forces of progressive justice communities fighting back against capital over the last 10 years. And I'm not just thinking here about the progressive governments of Venezuela, Cuba, Ecuador, Bolivia, but also even in the broader pink tide of the other social democratic countries, which have still kept with a capitalist agenda, but have tried to resist perhaps some of the worst depredations of imperialism coming down from their North American neighbors and coming from the European Union at the same time. And really, this is a battle about who's going to run the future? Who's going to run the world in which we live? Is it going to be run for and by big business? Or is it actually going to be something which we can take back control of and see run in the interests of society and with respect to the environmental, the ecological limits in which we live. And the key battleground for this is over these free trade agreements, so-called. These new treaties which basically establish who it is who's going to have the power in the future. And if you look at the Western Hemisphere in the Americas, the US is trying to, to negotiate this trans-Pacific partnership. That's for them, in a sense, looking west across the Pacific. And it encompasses Mexico, Peru, Chile, and then a whole host of Asian and, and, Latin, and um, Australasian countries as well. Looking east, and this is the one which refers to us, the US is trying to introduce TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And that's just between the European Union and the USA. And both of them represent what they have explicitly said is going to be the blueprint for the future. If we can get it done between our countries, then these can be living agreements which are rolled out to the rest of the world. And because they will encompass the great blocks of world trade, it will be almost impossible for other countries to say we've got an alternative agenda, we've got an alternative model that we want to put in place of this, and a model which actually represents the needs and the aspirations of people rather than just the interests of big transnational capital. The key thing for us, I suppose, here in this country is that TTIP is our opportunity to fight back. 
because TTIP is the one which we have control of. And I haven't, I've come in with a very optimistic um, sense here, having fight, fought for the last 20 years against these free trade agreements. This is perhaps the most exciting and most optimistic that I've been, that the whole situation has been over the last 20 years. I'm going to whiz through what TTIP is. Three main pillars. First of them is deregulation. These are not old style 20th century trade agreements where you would just be talking about tariffs at the border. This is about reaching behind the border into our public spaces and saying it's about getting rid of all of the standards, the regulations and the rules that prevent transnational corporations maximizing their profits. They've said this explicitly. They've said this isn't about the tariffs. There are no tariffs between the EU and the US. We've got rid of them years ago. This is about reaching behind the border and trying to re-engineer your spaces so that big business doesn't have to deal with labor standards. Why should a US corporation want to have to deal with labor standards? In the US, you don't even have a right to paid holidays. So why on earth do they want to have to deal with that sort of right in Europe? Also, environmental standards. We in Europe have the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle says, if you, big business, cannot prove that this new substance you want to introduce is safe, then we're going to take the precaution of saying you can't introduce it. In the States, it's 100% the other way around. If the government can't prove it's unsafe, then big business gets to introduce it as it likes. And that leads to completely different outcomes. Take cosmetics, for example. Cosmetics, which are pretty close to people. You put them on your face. In the European Union, there are 1,300 substances that are banned for use in cosmetics. In the States, it's 12. I mean, that's the sort of difference we're talking about. In Europe, complete bans on GM food entering into the food chain. In the States, 70% of all food sold in supermarkets contains GM ingredients. And what they're saying is, we don't want to have these rules and these standards blocking us coming through into your markets. We want to have a harmonization, a lowering of standards, so that big business no longer has to apply them. So the first pillar, deregulation, getting rid of the standards that business doesn't want to have to deal with. The second pillar, privatization. This is standard. They want to have more and more private sector access to those markets that have been closed to them for years and years. And that can be our public services markets, health markets, the states. They've been looking over at the NHS for years and years thinking this is the glittering prize we want to get our hands on. Also education, water, wastewater, post, transport. All of the services that we want to have in public hands, or in this country get back into public hands, are exactly the ones that these trade agreements are trying to open up. Also the public service contracts. So when you have a local government giving out contracts saying, we only want to give this contract on the understanding that the people who take it will pay all of their employees a living wage. Well, exactly those sort of conditions are being wiped out as a result of this privatization push. The third pillar of TTIP is the introduction of these new, completely unprecedented powers for investors, the Investor State Dispute Supplement Mechanism, if you want the jargon, the ISDS side bit, which enables investors, just like in the Pacific Rim El Salvador case, to take whole countries to court. It elevates capital to the same status as the nation state. And it says, you don't have to use the domestic court system, which is open and which we all know about, you get a special privilege to go around that system, you bypass the system, and you get your own private, secret courts. These arbitration tribunals, they're not courts at all, it's three corporate lawyers who sit and pronounce how many hundreds of millions of dollars are then handed over to these private companies. And Latin America, again, has got countless examples of this. I mean, Argentina was clobbered in the wake of the 2001 peso crisis, absolutely clobbered by dozens and dozens of companies going in one <coughs> after the other. And in the end, despite really resisting on all of these fronts, Argentina, at the end of last year, was forced to say, OK, for the first five of these, we're going to have to give half a billion dollars in compensation to settle just five of them. Ecuador, similarly, has been hit again and again. But now, what we're being told is, Britain, for the first time, is going to have to start opening up to the US. So US corporations can bring exactly the same cases behind closed doors 
and start challenging policy, public policy choices we might want to make here. And you get situations like in Australia, you may remember at the end of 2012, Australia brought in a public health law saying that all tobacco, all cigarettes in the future, could only be marketed in plain packaging. Well, they're now being sued for billions of dollars by Philip Morris, the big US tobacco multinational, because the, Philip Morris says this is no good for us. You know, you're basically preventing us from maximizing our profits in the future because you're saying you don't want to have so many people smoking. Uruguay has done exactly the same and it's being hit by Philip Morris at the same time. So you might think to yourself, all of these things sound absolutely crazy and the last thing that you want. But our government at the moment is trying to introduce it. And that's why we're trying to make this a massive issue politically here. Because if we can fight off TTIP here, then that sends a massive message across the world. And we have won against these in the past. They tried to bring in these powers in the 1990s through the multilateral agreements and investment, which came up at the OECD. We fought back and we won. In the Western Hemisphere, of course, they tried it through ALCA, the free trade area of the Americas. Fought back and won. They tried to introduce it through the WTO. We fought back and they had to take all of those issues off the table. We've won again and again and again, and we will win now, because the wheels are already beginning to come off their wagon. They're trying to get all of these new powers for investors, the investor state dispute settlement powers in. There was such an uproar, they had to freeze the negotiations on that bit of the treaty at the beginning of this year. They held a consultation, the most arcane, obscure consultation you could ever want. They thought maybe a couple of hundred people would respond. 150,000 people responded from Europe saying, we don't want it. And already now, they're beginning to find it more and more difficult to come across. We will have a meeting on Monday, just down the road. I don't know if everyone's seen the leaflets, but just down the road at Unite. If you haven't got these, go to the War and Want store. We've got lots of these leaflets there. Six o'clock on Monday. All of the trade unions in this country are now fully against TTIP. And that's a new situation in these free trade agreements. We've got the whole of the labor movement against it, all of the environmental movement against it, and all of the campaigning NGOs against it. We are going to make this into a big political issue here. It's already the number one issue in the mailbags of all MPs and MEPs. So please join this campaign because we can fight, we can win, and on this one, we will win. Thank you. John, I think that was a really you know, useful summary of all the issues and, and people have the to that meeting. We've literally got five minutes for some very, very brief comments because I know people may want to run into the lunch break but there's also the films um, that, are, that are being shown. So is there any very quick indication of any very quick points that we perhaps haven't covered or quick questions anyone wants to ask? Yourself. Can I say this? Uh, the problems in, in this country is uh, the people they are thinking in, in, in this case uh, the president or MP or the prime minister they they really they have only the representation but the power they are not able to make these differences these changes or anything what the proposing labor is the next election is simply coming back the same as is happening with with Tony Blair. It's getting the same is there a question? Like, no, the question is, is exactly. It's a need to change a new constitution, a new way of where the, the real power, in that case, is coming in, in the bankers and, and these big transnationals, coming to the, the people. There is a need. With no constitution, no nothing, what is the, the, the assurance of changes as you propose? Okay, any other very brief points or questions that haven't been raised? Right. Just there, and I've got the back. People could be really like almost 30 seconds because otherwise we won't have a chance. Well, Argentina, and the 93% of Argentina of the credit givers uh, said they would um, not uh, have to pay interest rates. Why did they choose it? And how should we say this? Okay. Um, I saw a hand at the back there somewhere. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You. Right. It was just about the select committee. I just wondered if the last speaker could uh, just add a couple of words to what happened in the select committee. Well, this week. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any? Because this will be their last chance, and then literally a few seconds. Right at the back. Um, if people want to come down to the Chevron stores, the first one on the right as you go in, um, we've got some black paint and glove gloves, so you can dip your hand in paint and show your support for the Chevron campaign. All right, very good. Okay, so let's do that. Right, so do you want? I think that's mostly for it. Yourself, John, on yeah. that quick, the specific question. Do you want to just come back on? But also, I think the question of, of the comrade here. I mean, you're absolutely right. There needs to be a political change. We've got a real problem at the moment that our government is one of the primary cheerleaders saying push all this through and, and even when there's resistance from the French and the Germans and the Austrian governments, the British government that says we want to have all of these powers for capital and absolutely nothing left for society. But what do you expect from the Tories and the Dems? The problem for us is that Labour is taking exactly the same position now. And Labour in this country has said, we are also in favour of this deal. OK, we want to get a bit of a carve out for the NHS, yes, yes. because there's been a bit of a push about that. And maybe we want to have a bit more transparency when it comes to these investor state disputes. We're not saying we don't want transparency. It's like having, you know, you can have a legalised torture, but put up a little sign on the outside saying when the torture is going to take place. You know, it's absolutely hopeless. And until we get some proper challenge on all sides of that divide, Labour is going to take us down exactly the same path as the Tories and the Lib Dems. In terms of what's been happening this week, there have been some hearings for the Select Committee which looks over Biz, the Department of Business in this country. And they've been calling forward some evidence against the government position. The problem is, again, the people who sit on those committees are Labour, Lib Dem and Tory, and they're all saying we don't believe any of the stuff that's been put out against it. Remember, it's not our statistics. The European Commission's own impact assessment says one million people will lose their jobs as a direct result of TTIP in the EU and the US. So how on earth can Labour be sticking up for that? And we will continue to go back to this committee and to all of the other committees, but it's up to everybody in this room. When we contact our MPs and say that we will not have anything to do with this, remember, next year they want your vote. Tell them, yeah. you can't have my vote unless yeah. you're going to stand up against it. Yeah. Daniel's just going to have one minute just to answer the point there. Yeah, just very quickly. Um, I think they just made uh, the 93% that agreed to a restructure. I think they just made a pragmatic decision. You know, they were still going to make approximately 400% profit on their initial <laughs> investment, which is huge. You know, it's enormous. I think, um, you know, international debt restructuring processes go on often. And, um, you know, the ones that held out who went after the 1,400% profit, I think um, those, those who agreed to the restructuring simply thought to ourselves, well, this is going to give us bad PR, this is court costs to pay, it's going to be a long, drawn-out process, and I think it's as simple as that, really. They're, they're greedy, but they're a bit less greedy than the hedge funds. <laughs> the hedge funds. Okay. Thank you. Can I just thank all of our speakers? I mean, obviously, we did get a bit squeezed on time on the discussion, but I think it was pretty diverse and, and very Good. informative range of speakers. Um, as John said, we're in the run-up to an election in this country, so there's a an absolutely perfect time to put some pressure on. Go and visit the stall, support the campaigns, um, and, and thanks everyone for coming this afternoon.